So my name is Rajat Manohar. I, I'm a faculty member in uh, engineering at Yale, and we design computer chips. Uh, this is a quite a big departure from some of the topics we've heard from before. And uh, normally, if I gave a talk that had inference in its title, people would be wondering what AI hardware I was designing. Uh, but that's not what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm th view me as a consumer of inference. I have questions about whether something I'm doing is a good idea or not, and I want to see if that's true, and how do we go about evaluating these things in the design of a chip. So I'll give you a little bit of background on the kind of things that we work on, just to get, give you some sense, because it's quite different. But it was interesting to see the talks this morning, because I see many commonalities and models that are being talked about in different disciplines. So, and you will probably see figures that look familiar to you from the talks we've heard earlier. So, um, so I'm a computer engineer. What does that mean? We design and build computers, OK? So, um, and this is actually, most people think of this as a very you know, formulaic process, but I would argue this is actually, you know, I would argue it's more like art uh, rather than um, science, because you are coming up, it's a creative process. You're trying to see if something's a good idea or not. And, the, and this design can happen at many different levels of abstraction. And this is kind of, you'll see this as a theme on how we try to understand if some idea we have is a good idea or not, right? And you know, these abstractions go all the way down from physics all the way down to you know, the software running on your computer. And, there are diff and at every level, there are many sort of intermediate levels. This is all subdivided to, so that we can actually manage the complexity. Um, and throughout, um, even though most people don't do this, I have a particular bias in the way we work on our, our systems. And, we have mathematical models that we can use at many different levels of abstraction. Okay? So I mean, these are some examples of things we do. At the end of the day, we design something that looks like uh, you know, this picture over here. Uh, you can just think of it as geometry. It's lots of rectangles, different colors. Different colors are different materials. You're really specifying exactly what the manufacturer has to do to manufacture the electronics. Okay? So that's, that's uh, the sort of things we do. And these are engineered systems, right? So you think, I have full control at the nanometer scale of what every little piece is doing. So this should be easy. It should be easy for us to figure out whether this is good or bad. It's all, you know, I have full control. I have software. I can represent everything. No problem. But the problem arises simply because um, these systems are extremely complicated. Um, so there are billions of components interconnected. It's actually pretty sh astounding what we can make today. Uh, everybody takes this for granted. Uh, we can make systems which have billions of components integrated at the nanometer scale, and they cost $100, right? Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't have a cell phone. Um, so that's, that's the kind of thing we look at. And the question is, you know, this is the question I'm trying to answer. I have some idea. I think this is a good idea, but is it actually good? I'm trying to answer this question. And this idea could be anything. I have a new way to do you know, my latest machine learning hardware. I have a new way to do my, my chip. I have a new way to design my phone. Is this, is this good or not? And uh, this is sort of the standard paper. This is my car, this is like almost every paper you read looks like this. Okay? It says, we have this great idea. Uh, we implemented the original system without this idea and with this idea. And we got these two different numbers. One is better than the other. My idea is good. Right? That's all the papers. But, you know, a lot is left unsaid. And, and this is the part where it starts getting interesting. Okay? Uh, by the way, I, this happens in many disciplines. I'm just picking on mine. So, uh, you know, a lot of people don't talk about what didn't work. Um, and a lot more, as we all know, doesn't work than does work. Um, a lot of people don't tell you what's bad about what you, your great idea. Uh, in fact, if you do that, you have a very good chance your paper won't even get published because you actually admitted that this isn't a perfect idea. And um, the, uh, the thing that is always hidden, I, I find it's very, very rare to find this, is to say, you know, this idea is only good because this critical parameter has to have this particular value, and any uncertainty there is going to blow it all up. Um, you know, I, I had this fun experiment when I was teaching a class one year where we were reading papers, and as homework, I, made, I picked a small piece of the paper, and I asked a, pro, a group of students to replicate those results. That's it. Nothing else. Just, and then present the paper. So they had to present it 
first, and then they had to replicate the results and then represent the paper. And I can tell you that not a single person reached the same conclusions as the authors of any paper we had read. Right? And these papers are you know, famous papers by famous authors from famous universities. Right? It was very interesting. I, the students were just shocked. Right? I mean, we all know this is, you know, I don't think anybody in this room is surprised. But anyway. But I think it was actually very helpful for the students to understand the limitations of what's going on. So what are the challenges for in, in, my, uh, in the sort of the world we work on in computer design? Um, we have a lot of tools at our disposal. Okay, so I should, I should admit that up front. You know, this is an, as I said, it's an engineered system. Usually we're, we're not trying to do something that might like, you know, might create controversy in sort of the physical laws or anything like that. We're very far away from that. Um, you're top, typically looking at classical systems, even the ones which have quantum effects. They have, they have understood models. Um, we can run simulations at varying levels of detail. Okay? But I can tell you that you know, there's, depending on what level of detail you want, the execution runtime is 8, 9, 10 orders of magnitude slower. Okay? So there's just no way you can do a first principles calculation to compute what you need to know. Okay, it's just not even possible. Um, by the way, that eight orders of magnitude includes you know, running this on the fastest supercomputers in the world. Okay, so you know, don't worry. The computers are faster. That don't, that's not a problem. Right? I always used to joke that we bootstrap the next generation of computers by designing faster computers that we can then use to design the next computer. And so that's what keeps things tractable. Um, Mathematical models. So there are lots and lots of different mathematical models that are used to describe, uh, and I'm going to just pick one metric for this talk, which is performance. How fast does my computer run? Just one metric. There are many others, but let's just pick one. Um, it's challenging to capture all the details. So the good thing about a mathematical model is it allows you to try to capture the essence of what you're trying to model and ignore details. But the details sometimes do matter, and then you have to sort of figure out what, what's good or what's bad. Okay, so... Uh, and I hate to say this, but this is definitely true. There are actually like, you know, sections of conferences devoted to models where there's a large community that writes hundreds of papers a year, and the models are completely wrong. Well, they're not wrong. They just don't correspond to reality. So, um, and they actually never did. Okay, so it's very interesting. But, but you can prove very nice theorems, um, which is a very, you know, that's why the academic community sort of works it. And then... The last thing you can do is you can actually build the system and see, is this even good? The problem is this is a huge undertaking. Okay? Uh, just to give you some calibration, you, know, if you, you can know these numbers when companies fail. Okay, so uh, companies like Intel have announced large projects that they canceled and you know, take a $5 billion hit on their balance sheet for one chip. Right? So these are extremely expensive, prop it's an extremely expensive proposition. And the problem is systems are complex. No one has enough space to describe all the details to even do a reproducible experiment. Right? Even though it's an engineered system, somebody has a model somewhere. They don't want to tell you what it is. So the other part of this problem in this particular domain is companies are making a lot of money. So uh, they don't actually want to tell you what they did. Uh, so that's a problem. So there's a lot of hidden information. Um, but the good news is because there's a lot of money at stake, when people build these models and they write papers, they actually have a very good incentive to get them right. Okay? Because if they're wrong, I mean, this has actually happened. There are major companies that went out of business because the models they were using were wrong. Okay? Uh, it happened you know, about 10 years ago, for example. So, so there's good and bad. But, I mean, the, but if you look at the complexity of the systems we are trying to model, um, I'm, I'm, now, I'm now simplifying things a bit. We've got about, a, about 10 billion components at uh, you know, individual com device level. By the way, the, you, could go, you could go to the materials and the physics. I, I'm not even going there. Okay? Th th that's even much more complicated. Um, and even if you get to like, the scale of a single chip, in the sim most simplified model, you'd have about 1,000 to 10,000 components all operating concurrently, all with some complexity in terms of the state, internal state transitions and so on and so forth. So that's the kind of systems we're talking about. So let me give you a very simple example of what makes this hard and show you sort of an example of what we, the kind of things we do to try to model these systems. So here is a simple sort of, there's a standard compute pipeline. Okay, so what, what is this picture trying to show? I have inputs coming in, and then there are these different steps 
for, for computation. And the first step takes 20 units of time, and then you hand over, so it's like an assembly line, right? You hand over something to the next step, right? It's a very simple pipeline, 20 units of time for the first step, 20 to the second, 10 to the third. It's very straightforward. And I'm going to take two different variants, okay? One where it's 20, 20, 10, and 10, 20, 10. And my idea is something that will speed up step two, okay? I can look at the second system and say, this is a great idea, right? Things got faster. But if I apply it to the first one, nothing improved. The throughput of the system has not changed because you're still limited by this first step that takes 20 time units. And so you think this is not, this is not a great idea. So just depending on which system you're evaluating, even though sort of locally you are improving some quantitative metric very clearly, the overall system didn't improve, right? And this can get... So this is the, the simplest example I could think of because it's uh, you know, easy to understand. But the networks of these pipelines that are used to build these chips have, as I said, tens of thousands, if not you know, hundreds of thousands of components. They're not this simple. Data routing depends on the value. So for example, let's take a very simple example. Maybe step one takes either 10 or 20 units of time, depending on what the input data are. Now, all of a sudden, this becomes a very complicated question. Depends on the context. Depends on what the actual inputs might be in real life, whatever that means. Right? Um, if I run a program versus you running a program, you might get different results. So we, can, we actually can have a real difference in our evaluation of the exact same idea on the exact same system. I, I might think it's good, and you might think it's bad, and we are both right. Okay? So th this is the kind of challenge that we have. Right? Um, but you can say, well, okay, I have this pipeline. Why don't we try to analyze this? I have some you know, logical description of the entire system in some digital format, okay? at whatever level of detail. I, I, have very, I have actually have the, level, I have the description at many, 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 many levels of detail. Okay? That's kind of how we can sort of deal with the complexity. So why don't we just analyze it? Well, it turns out that if you assume something as simple as a, I can represent integers and simple things like addition, then everything is immediately uncomputable, like, uh, you know, like because of Goodell's incompleteness theorem, literally. So you can't compute anything. So you can say, okay, well, that assumes infinite precision arithmetic, all sorts of things. So, okay, things are finite state. Okay, well, I only have two to the 10 to the nine states to, to compute. So it's just not tractable, right? So these are the kind of things we grapple with. And so sort of what we try to work on is how could we come up with Models that are reasonable approximations where we can try to do some of the things that we need to do, try to answer some of the questions in terms of evaluating ideas um, in a way that's you know, reasonable, timely, something that we can actually use. Right? And I'm going to show you example, uh, an example of a very a simplified model that's actually useful, even though it's wrong. Okay? Uh, it's an approximation, but it's, it's still it, it's very helpful. Uh, and, uh, it was funny, there was a, there's a picture that looks very similar to this uh, earlier today. Uh, these are models. The idea here is I've got, um, oh, I should just use this. I've got these little things here. This is B minus Y up C up. At the, at the lowest level, well, not even the lowest, but at a, at a reasonably low level of abstraction, I have variables in my system that can take binary values, zeros and ones. This says B went B down, so B went from one to zero. This was an event, right? That's very simple. And these arrows are trying to indicate, and you know, this is cause, and actually, we engineered the system, so we know that we've built some physical device that has B as an input and Y as an output, and B going down causes Y to go up. That's because there's a device that literally implements this particular thing. Uh, function feature. So you can draw these arrows, and now I have these two arrows here going to B plus that says, I have to wait for both of these to happen before B goes up, right? So that, that's the kind of system. And then this has a cycle, but that's OK, because you see I've marked the cycle. Uh, the idea here is you unroll this and uh, you, you label all these events. This is the first appearance of B down or B up. So you, you, you tag everyone, every event with an integer, and so you can unroll this graph. But because, remember, I'm building some physical system that I'm modeling, it turns out you can collapse this graph into a, a, a cyclic graph who's unfolding in t is actually the computation, right? That's the idea. And then, um, so it turns out that uh, 
these structures have been studied for forever, including in pure mathematics. If, uh, if you're a mathematician, these are called max plus algebras. There are lots of theorems in the field of dynamics and pure mathematics that analyze these things to try to figure out what ha when events occur, things of that nature. So what we can do with the, something like this is we can uh, come up with some theoretical results. Now that I have an abstract model that says, for example, the model would say that the time at which y up occurs is the time at which b down occurs plus some delay. Where did I get this delay from? That's an abstraction based on sort of the physics of the electronics. We know sort of the time temporal relationships between sort of those two events, and we abstract that as a number. Okay? Again, this is wrong, but it's quite useful. Right? Um, so that's kind of what we do. And then turns out that even though these t everything is running in continuous time, right? Uh, you've got millions of these things. You, you, the, the graph for a normal chip would have you know millions of uh, you know tens of millions of these nodes, uh, for at least to get to the scale where the analysis is useful. Um, you'd have tens of millions of these sort of events, and you, you they all have delay calculations. It's actually non-trivial to do all of this stuff, um, but you can prove uh, theoretical results about the model. Which, are, which then give you a very good idea of how fast your chip is going to run. So one of the things you can do, for example, is if you say, I have the time for a transition or an event in this system, the ith occurrence, if I denote that by time. Um, so you can actually prove that the, the system eventually becomes sort of periodic, but not, in, not fully periodic, periodic at an unfolding. So what this basically says is the time of a transition at some time uh, at index i m plus j is some constant plus m times another constant times i. So, the, so i and j are the two variables here. So you can see that all the transitions eventually become periodic. So you can actually prove this mathematically. It's, it's not fun, it's, but you can do it. It's a long proof. Uh, it turns out that there are simplified versions of these graphs, like actually the one here, where it's, I, can pro I prove this in like 15 minutes in my class to undergraduates. I can do that. But as soon as you start removing the restrictions and getting these graphs to correspond to, to circuits that you build, um, the proof is a, a lot more complicated. But it, we, we actually worked this out not too long ago. So that's the sort of thing we do. And then what, what we can then do is, now that we have a mathematical formula for what we know the system's going to look like in the steady state, I can figure out how fast things are going to run when every event happens. And I can now write software to take something that only has a million in, you know, uh, vertices and edges and tell me how fast my chip is going to run. Okay? And this is actually pretty tractable. So you can actually do this. We have software that does this. Uh, you know, it's in the public domain. Um, that's the kind of thing we do for, you know, to try to figure out how fast the system is going to run. But again, you know, this is an approximation. Okay? A very simple change you can do to this is, for example, B going down the time at which this occurs is going to be the max of the two possible predecessors, right? Because you have to wait for both of them. But that doesn't correspond to most things. I could, just, I could change when one of my input changes, then I would get min. As soon as I add that complexity, there's an exponential factor that gets added to the complexity of the algorithm that you need. Okay? So it's, these, these, it's, it's actually very interesting. So we, the reason we use this model is not because it's right, it's because it's, it's actually tractable, right? Um, so that's the sort of thing we do um, to design our systems. Uh, it turns out it's actually quite useful in spite of that. Um, there's another set of things that we do to analyze systems. Um, and uh, it's funny that you know, the, the, the session's called causality here. The, the technical term that's actually used in the literature, in, the, in our modeling literature, is actually called potential causality. Okay? And the reason it's called potential causality is because exact causality can't be computed. It's too complicated. So you have an approximation of it that we call potential causality. And um, actually, we have the first results on this as it applies to circuits. This idea is actually very old from the 70s, which applies to actually distributed systems like computer networks. But we've actually got, got the equivalent idea that we use the same words because it's basically the same idea when we are talking about individual components of digital electronics like signals and wires. And what you can do is very, in, so the way you know if some, there's causality in, our, in this kind of analysis is sort of interesting. What we argue is that if, so this is a, a timeline. Uh, by the way, you, ca, you can never build this timeline, it's too, it's too complicated, but you've got a timeline 
I've got all the variables in my system, everything, because I engineered it. I know every single variable, not just the inputs and outputs, but all the internal state possible. And then I'm going to put a little dot here that says the variable changed. That's all. That's all that means. And so I can build a timeline, a logical timeline. Okay, um, we talk about what everything changed. And then I can pick a particular variable at a particular point in time and say, what caused this variable to have this value at this time? And because I have the full topology of my engineered system, I can actually say, OK, well, the first thing I can tell you is the fact that this variable was at, uh, at a particular value at this time depends on its his own history. right? So that's what this horizontal gray bar is. Uh, sorry, the one, this one right here, right, the one with x. And then at this point, it changed. And this change from the sort of that previous graph came from these two other variables having certain values. So I depend on my neighbors at that previous point in time. They depend on their own history and so on and so forth. So I can actually build a cone of dependencies. Okay, that's, that's kind of how we say what, what is, and, and this is potential causality because I guess I said it's an approximate approximation, right? And then the reason we, can, we, we say that this is potential causality is because you can now prove mathematically in the model that Everything outside that cone, you can reorder in time. There exists an alternate execution where this node would have this value at this particular point in time, and everything else can be reordered so that, in fact, it didn't change. Even though it's actually changed, I could have had an execution where it didn't change. And therefore, therefore it's not causally dependent. Right? So we construct these alternate executions in the proof to show that the reason the causality is limited to this cone is because everything else could be postponed. Didn't have to have happened. Does that make sense? So that's the kind of sort of theory that we use to argue about what's dependent. And, and again, this is an engineered system, so I, I actually know all the edges, right? So people are talking about systems where we don't know what the variables are. It's a totally different world. But that's the sort of thing that we do. Okay. I have a couple of minutes left. And so I thought I would just stop by talk, uh, end with just talking about sort of the approach that the, the, the field takes to try to make sure that you know, the results we get with sort of more abstract models lines up with when you actually manufacture the device and you know, get it. So by the way, just if you, you may not know these costs, but um, to manufacture a chip costs roughly five to $10 million to get the first part. And then every additional one costs $50. This is a very interesting economics. OK, so imagine if you're writing software, if you, every time you hit compile, you have to pay $5 million. OK, so don't do that too often. The funny thing is, in spite of that, sometimes it's cheaper for people to make the chip and test it than to run the simulations. OK, believe it or not. OK, I used to always wonder why companies wasted so much money fabricating these chips. And at some point, I realized, oh, yeah, it's much cheaper to do that than to pay the people to wait for the simulation to be done. That's why, right? So it's a very interesting world. <laughs> um, so at the materials level, I mean, you basically, by the way, all of these things are all underpinned by experimental data. This is being constantly gathered every, I would say, every week, every month, throughout the last 40 years. Uh, companies are running examples, universities are doing research. It's, I mean, there's a huge group of people working on this at every different level of abstraction. They collect experimental data from materials. They validate that against their physics models, or vice versa, the other way around, right? They validate their models with the experimental data. They run numerical simulations and make sure that they line up. Once they're happy with that, those models are then used to build the next level of ab abstraction. So you build models out of the previous levels that have been validating against the lower level physics of the materials. Uh, and then you build your device, individual components, devices. Again, these are fabricated and tested. And, you know, all of this happens. Uh, the, sometimes the next level, uh, the whole discipline of building these models is sometimes called compact models because they're not first principles physics calculations. They would be too slow. They're much more compact. They have few parameters, uh, well, a few thousand parameters. Um, again, all of the numerical simulations underpin all of this at the lowest level of abstraction. At some point, you go to you know, ones and zeros. Okay? And at that point, you switch from pure numerical simulation to simulations that have delay values as real numbers. But then 
you, you do this as an event-based model. Okay, so you record what are the things, you know, you know, an input changes that causes this output to change so many picoseconds later, you record that. Okay? Um, and then you scale up by saying, okay, I now have something that adds two numbers. So now I'm going to say a block that adds inputs and outputs. Again, you're, you're losing fidelity at all of these levels of abstraction, but that's essentially how we go about trying to figure out what's going on. So I hope I've given you a flavor for the sorts of things we do and um, you know, how we go, try to make sure that we're not wrong. And by the way, we're wrong all the time. I should just, just be clear. But, uh, and that's, that's actually partially why there's very little big change. If, if you look at what's in your phone last year versus this year, the, the delta is extremely small. And the reason is if you make a big change, it's like, well, I have no idea whether it's going to work at all, and no one is willing to take the risk because, you know, companies have, many companies have gone out of business by doing that. So it's a, it's a very, it's a sort of an interesting setup. But without that, I'll stop. Yeah, it's a great talk. Um, so when you prove something about the higher level model, um, there's kind of an additional proof which is required, which is about the relationship between the higher level model and the lower level model. Correct. So it's one thing to say that you know, your high level model you know, yep. is periodic or whatever. Um, but the second connection is often, do you, like, to what extent do you formalize that, or is it just an intuition as a de system designer um, that this is more or less correct. Uh, to, what, to, to what extent can that be made systematic, uh, this relationship between, between the different levels? Right. So uh, that's a great question. Um, so when you switch from what... So there are two parts of the question, actually. I, I don't know if you intended it that way, but I think there are two parts of the question, so I'll answer that in two parts. One of the levels is just going from, say, materials to devices to Boolean values. There's that part of the stack. And at that part, there's a pretty clear sort of functional abstraction. There's, there's, there's basically uh, two, in, two injections, essentially, that are used to go from one repre run information representation to the other. And so th those are being cross-checked all the time. So that, at that point, it's very consistent. Once you go from the, the low-level Booleans all the way up to, say, you know, a plus to mean addition, that's no longer the case. Uh, for that, we actually use... Uh, Actually, we actually have the first uh, automated flow to do this, believe it or not. Uh, we'll see if the paper gets accepted, most likely not. Um, where we, we actually use a combination of formal, like, formal math, like theorem proving, actually we use a combination of theorem proving, model checking, and something called translation validation. These are all three ways to do formal verification. We need all three, it turns out. They're, all of them have strengths and weaknesses, and we kind of use them appropriately. Where we, can, we actually have an end-to-end -end mathematical proof from the highest level of abstraction at which we simulate, all the way down to the zeros and ones. But that's actually, like, I mean, as I said, the paper's in submitted, but you know, it'll get rejected a few times, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, but yeah, that, that's a great question. It's a, it's a very hard problem, actually. Um, but we, yeah, so because the, what, what we found is the way we can do it is because the system is engineered, we track, when we are designing the system, we keep track of side information. So all of these tools work by searching in some complex space, and this search is you know, exponentially hard. But because we know how we designed it, we can constrain it and guide it in the right way. And so we keep the side information along, and then you can do, actually generate a mathematical proof. Thank yeah. you. I suggest we thank you very much. <laughs>